Knowledge Products presents The Giants of Philosophy, Baruch Spinoza, narrated by Charlton Heston, Part 4. Proceeding, he says, as a scientist would, Spinoza undertakes to compare different parts of the Bible, noting similarities and contrasts in what is said and trying to understand the intentions of the authors of the text. Much stands in the way of such a project, he admits. For example, ancient Hebrew had no vowels and no punctuation, so it often admits of more than one reading. Also, to interpret a text with confidence, we need to know who wrote it, at what time, and under what circumstances. Unfortunately, many of these facts about the Bible are not known. Interpretation is difficult without having all the relevant historical information, but Spinoza attempts to find a meaningful and faithful reading by attending carefully to the text itself. A key issue regarding the Bible, of course, is the question of its status as divine revelation. That is, whether the Bible is the word of God or of men. Traditional claims of its uniquely divine status usually rest on two considerations. First, prophets are credited with divine authority as sources of revelation. Second, the reported miracles are believed to verify the presence of the divine and to give special weight to the words of the miracle worker. Spinoza discusses each of these at length, beginning with prophecy. Spinoza notes that only Moses is explicitly said to have directly heard the voice of God. The other prophets are said to have received their messages in dreams or visions, or as the Spirit of God came upon them. The imagination is obviously active in dreams and visions, and Spinoza explains at length that the Hebrew word which is translated as spirit is a word with many meanings, including breath, habit of mind, and even life itself. Now, Spinoza is happy to grant that the power of God is manifest in the knowledge of the prophets, for, as we've seen, he believes that all things, including all human thoughts, are manifestations of the power of God. He emphasizes the role that imagination plays in the visions and pronouncements of the prophets in order to point out that the voice of the prophet is not itself the voice of God. It's the voice of a human being expressing godly truth as he has understood it subject to his own accustomed ways of thinking and of imagining. This view suggests that the prophets are distinguished from other people by the greater vividness of their imaginations and the greater force of their verbal powers of expression. The fact that the imagination plays an important role in the revelations of the prophets suggests to Spinoza that their pronouncements are influenced by their personal differences in background and intellect. Hence, Spinoza believes that they shouldn't be taken as totally reliable authorities on theoretical or speculative questions, nor did the prophets know all things, as some clerics have tried to claim. Everyone has been strangely hasty in affirming that the prophets knew everything within the scope of human intellect, and although certain passages of scripture plainly affirm that the prophets were in certain respects ignorant, such persons would rather say that they do not understand the passages than admit that there was anything which the prophets did not know. Relying on his stated method of looking to the Bible itself, Spinoza cites a number of passages which indicate that the prophets were ignorant of certain matters of mathematics, astronomy, and theology. He then cites instances in which they differed with one another in ways which seem most easily explained by individual differences in their personal backgrounds and their accustomed ways of thinking and imagining. So did the revelation vary according to individual disposition and temperament and according to the opinions previously held. If a prophet was cheerful in disposition, victories, peace, and events which make men glad were revealed to him. If, on the other hand, he was melancholy, wars, massacres, and calamities were revealed. Spinoza gives examples from Scripture for each of these claims, and he describes how a prophet's previously held opinions affect his prophecy. Spinoza notes that the different prophets had different methods of forecasting the future. Even the style of prophecy varied according to the eloquence of the prophet. As Spinoza puts it, the prophecies of Ezekiel and Amos are not written in a cultivated style like those of Isaiah and Nahum. Finally, the scripture reveals that the prophets differed with one another in the actual content of their revelations and the symbols they used to express them. 
Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord departing from the temple in a different form from that presented to Ezekiel. Isaiah saw seraphim with six wings. Ezekiel, beasts with four wings. Isaiah saw God clothed and sitting on a royal throne. Ezekiel saw him in the likeness of a fire. Each, doubtless, saw God in the form in which he usually imagined him. Spinoza might sound as if he's trying to undermine the credibility of everything the prophets proclaimed, but he says he only wants to distinguish the kernel of divine truth in their utterances from the imaginative form used to express them. Spinoza believes that for all their obvious differences, the prophets agree about morality and about the way that people should live with each other. The fundamental truths of the scriptures are moral truths, but these truths are expressed as unusual visions and oracles in ways congenial to the imaginations of the prophets and likely to stir the imaginations of their listeners. Our greatest danger, Spinoza believes, is the tendency to confuse the imaginative garb of prophecy with the moral truth it's intended to convey. This tendency takes imaginative visions to be divinely guaranteed truths about theological, speculative, or scientific matters. The ethical teachings of prophecy are clear enough to everyone, including the uneducated. But Spinoza believes when learned theologians argue about the nature of God based on their differing interpretations of prophetic visions, only confusion and discord can result. Having discussed prophecy, Spinoza turns his attention to the second authority often used to support the scriptures. The Bible claims that miracles were performed to show the presence of God and supposedly to demonstrate the divine authority of the miracle worker. Interpreting the miracle stories is a difficult matter. Much depends on the meaning of the word miracle. Miracles are most often taken to be events that are contrary to the laws of nature. As we've seen, Spinoza's philosophy says the laws of nature follow necessarily and immutably from the eternal essence of God. From this perspective, it's strictly impossible that any event could contradict the laws of nature. In his view, miracles cannot occur. But in the Tractatus, the theological political treatise, Spinoza's resolved to focus on the scriptures themselves so he can't elaborate on his own non-biblical view. Therefore, he cites a number of passages in which the scriptures themselves declare that God is immutable and unchangeable. In part, he bases his argument against miracles on these passages. More importantly, though, Spinoza argues that only our human prejudice makes us believe that a few ostensibly miraculous events provide more evidence of God's power than the constant orderly working of nature we see all the time. He says nature provides the best evidence we could possibly have that an eternal and omnipotent God exists. The masses think that the power and providence of God are most clearly displayed by events that are extraordinary and contrary to the conception they have formed of nature. They think that the clearest possible proof of God's existence is afforded when nature, as they suppose, breaks her accustomed order. They suppose that God is inactive so long as nature works in her accustomed order and vice versa, that the power of nature and natural causes are idle so long as God is acting. Thus they imagine two powers, distinct from one another, the power of God and the power of nature. What they mean by either, and what they understand by God and nature, they do not know, except that they imagine the power of God to be like that of some royal potentate. Spinoza, of course, holds that the laws of nature always and everywhere express the eternal, infinite power of God. Should anything happen contrary to nature, it would be evidence that God's power and constancy had lapsed. This, he holds, is impossible. Concluding his discussion of miracles, Spinoza points out that the Jews and the early Christians, being pious people and knowing little of the laws of nature, often referred to things as being done by God. Their way of speaking sometimes suggests miraculous divine intervention, 
when in fact they intended nothing of the sort. Hence, when the Bible says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, it only means that Pharaoh was obstinate. When it says that God opened the windows of heaven, it only means that it rained very hard, and so on. Spinoza says events reported as miracles are actually natural events that people at the time couldn't understand. The events seemed explainable only by supernatural intervention. But, as Spinoza sees it, all events in nature are, in a sense, acts of God. Thus, all events attest to his power and glory. Miracles are almost, by definition, things that we don't understand. And Spinoza believes we can't gain knowledge, knowledge of God or anything else, from things we don't understand. He does feel, though, that reports of miracles serve a purpose. Like the dramatic visions of the prophets, reports of miracles impress on the people's imagination those profound lessons the prophets, Jesus, and the apostles were teaching. These wise yet simple lessons are about morals and ethics, about the best way to live and the importance of loving God and your neighbor. As we'll see, Spinoza believes these lessons are essential to human happiness. They're truths which can be known by everyone through the power of reason. But most people are more moved by appeals to the imagination, by wonders and strange occurrences. So the great spiritual teachers have framed their messages to teach the minds and the hearts of their hearers. Spinoza adds that these teachers who taught peace and piety certainly didn't want rancorous disagreement, even war, about minute interpretation of theological and scriptural questions. Spinoza argues that the important lessons in the scriptures are quite plain to anyone who reads the text with an open and reverent mind. The scriptures can't be considered authoritative on matters of science or even speculative theology. On these matters, the Bible's authors were, not surprisingly, often either silent or in disagreement with one another. Spinoza suggests that people who use the scriptures to foment discord or gain power over others are clearly not acting in the service of the living God. Indeed, such people undermine the sacredness of the scripture itself by misusing it. A thing is called sacred and divine when it is designed for promoting piety and continues sacred so long as it is religiously used. If the users cease to be pious, the thing ceases to be sacred. If it be turned to base uses, that which was formerly sacred becomes unclean and profane. Based on his reading of the scriptures, Spinoza concludes that the purpose of true religion is to promote virtue and encourage people to live piously and peacefully with one another. Most arguments about theology, doctrine, and ritual have nothing to do with virtue or peaceful living, so Spinoza maintains that the government shouldn't take sides in these arguments. The government should allow its citizens to believe and worship freely as they will. Thus, the first truly modern critical study of the Bible ends with a plea for religious freedom and tolerance. Spinoza warns us what will happen if one religious group gains control of the government's power. They will not scruple to assert that they have been directly chosen by God and that their laws are divine, whereas the laws of the state are human and should therefore yield obedience to the laws of God, in other words, to their own laws. Everyone must see that this is not a state of affairs conducive to public welfare. The arguments of the Tractatus are numerous and subtle. Only a few of them have been briefly summarized here. Spinoza hoped his work might serve to calm religious strife and encourage simple piety. He also wanted to strengthen the political position of the Republicans led by De Witt, who favored religious freedom for the Netherlands. By the time the Tractatus was published in 1670, though, the political situation was much worse. The Netherlands were at war. Many people were clamoring for William of Orange to take control. In this near-hysterical climate, it wasn't safe to publish the Tractatus openly. So it appeared anonymously, with its place of publication falsely listed as Hamburg in Germany. But hostile critics soon identified the true author, and the work was viciously attacked. One especially venomous critic called it an evil implement. It is forged in hell by a renegade Jew and the devil. 
and issued with the knowledge of Mr. DeFitt. There was no chance that Spinoza's vision of peace and piety would be realized under these circumstances. Two years later, DeVitt and his brother were lynched by an angry mob. Their mutilated bodies were hung from a pole. William of Orange was installed as the stateholder. The clerics gained influence not long after publication and sales of Spinoza's Tractatus Theologico Politicus was officially banned in the Netherlands. Spinoza's efforts to influence the politics of his own time were unsuccessful. His theological views were too far from the mainstream to gain many adherents. His critical and scholarly approach to the Bible was an affront to the fundamentalists. His hopes for a state in which there would be freedom of thought and religion were too progressive for the middle of the 17th century. But time passes. Views which seem radical to one age can become common sense in another. A century later, the United States Constitution would codify the freedoms of speech, of the press, and religion as basic principles of our government. Two centuries later, historically sensitive theologians would adopt many of Spinoza's methods and conclusions as the basis for scholarly biblical study. We've also seen that the vision of God's immanent presence in nature found adherence in the Romantic poets. And we've seen that scientists since then have embraced Spinoza's view that nature is a single unified system in which every event is causally determined. In many ways, his views have been vindicated by history. But perhaps we should remember that vindication was less important to Spinoza than what he called liberation or salvation. His goal was to find the way to happiness. I resolved to inquire whether there might be some real good the discovery and attainment of which would enable me to enjoy continuous, supreme, and unending happiness. Spinoza believed that in his doctrine of God, he discovered the foundation for the happiness he sought. But we've seen that according to his view, there is no heavenly father, there is no human free will, and the universe has no purpose. How could such a view provide the deep happiness Spinoza sought? For answer, we must turn to the other fields of philosophy where he made original and lasting contributions, the fields of ethics and moral psychology. This is the end of Part 4. Please download Part 5 to continue.